Hi everyone, this is Mr. N here, and uh, we've got another review here. This one's for Chapter 4. This is for Wonderful 4. This is Extra Review 1. We're going to be also be doing Extra Review 2 later, but for right now, let's go ahead and do this one. Um, for this first problem, it says, State whether the function satisfies MVT, which is the mean value theorem, on the given interval. If so, then find C that satisfies the conclusion for that. So what we're looking to do here is the mean value theorem. And so with the mean value theorem, we've got three parts that, uh, really two parts, and then the third that satisfies it, if parts one and two are true. In part one, we want to go ahead and see if this is continuous on my interval. Is it continuous? Yes, it is. I can choose any value between negative two and five, and I will get a result. So it is continuous there. <clears throat> is it differentiable? So let's see, f prime of x is 2x minus 3. Is it differentiable on this interval? Yes, it is differentiable. So now I can move on to part 3, which means I can find a point where the secant and the tangent are the same. So they're parallel. So in other words, I need to find where f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a all over the b minus a. So let's go ahead and find what f of b is. f of b in this case is going to end up being 14 and we can we can put in f prime of c so f prime of c let's just do that since that, that's the way I listed the equation is just going to be 2x or 2c minus 3 so 2c minus 3 equals alright f of b ends up being we're going to put negative, we're going to put 5 into my equation right here. And when I put 5 into it, I'll get 14. So then I'm going to find f of a. When I put negative 2 into my equation right here, I will go ahead and get 14 as well. And this is going to be over, at this point it really doesn't matter, but we'll write it in there anyway, 5 minus negative 2. So I get 0 over 7, which is 0. So now I have 2c minus 3 equaling 0, so c is going to be 3 over 2. Now I need to check, is 3 over 2 in my interval right here? Yes, it is. There is the c value that I've come up with. All right, moving on to the next one. For this one, to find the critical points and all this stuff, we will do this, I will do this um, after I do the other problems. I need a lot more room than I put on this worksheet, unfortunately. So I will just slide this down, and um, we will go ahead and come back to that problem in a second. So let's go ahead and move this out of the way. We'll slide this up, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so let's do this one now. Use the graph of f to estimate the values of c that satisfies the conclusion of the mean value theorem on negative 4 to 4. So the conclusion of the mean value theorem is that my, right here, oops, let's choose a color. The conclusion, and I'll choose red since the graph is in blue, <coughs> the conclusion means, as we said above, f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. And what does that mean? That the tangent in this case that's a tangent, is equal to the secant, the secant. Okay, so, well first let's see what the secant is. The secant is from negative 4, so I come over here at negative 4, and I want to put a point where the graph is. So at negative 4, there is my point. And then i got to go all the way over to 4 over here and find that corresponding point. It's right there, so we will put that there. And I want to connect these two points. Okay, so I went ahead and used my line tool, and I connected these two points from right here. So we can call this point A, point B. This is at negative 4, and this one was at the 4 right there. So I connected those, and I drew my secant. So now I need to find a tangent that is parallel to that. So basically... I need to create another parallel line to this. So let's see if I can use that tool again that I just used. And make a parallel line. And that's parallel like that. Close enough. And now let me see if I can somehow move this line and see. Now I want to move this line so that it touches this graph, so that it's a tangent to this graph. See, there's one spot right there where it's a tangent. 
there's another spot right there where it's a tangent, and yet a third spot right there where it's tangent. So I end up with three spots. The first spot, if I go in order, would be right there. So let's see if I can move that a little bit better. And the second one, if I use this tool again, so I have my second one here, and let's see if I can move this up to here. And let's go ahead and see if I can use this to create another one. And we will go ahead and see if we can move this third one over to right there. Okay, so now I have my three secants. Now let's look, take a look at these points. Right here, that is the tangent point. This is a tangent point, and that's a tangent point. So I'm going to guesstimate at these values. So this C right here is, we'll say, approximately, oh, we'll say negative 3. This is 3.5, so we'll say negative... Mm, this first one we'll say C is approximately negative 3.4. On this one we'll say C is approximately negative 1 and there's 0.5. We could say about negative 1.4 as well. And on this one we can say C is approximately, there's 2.5, we'll keep it at 2.5. So I've got my three approximate values of C. C is approximately negative 3.4 for one of the secants being par for one of the tangents being parallel to the secant. Then the next one, C is approximately negative 1.4. For this secant right here that I'm talking about, this tangent to be parallel to the secant AB. And then C is approximately 2.5. So basically I had my line, my secant from A to B and let me go through this again from A to B. I connected those, and now I had to find parallel lines which needed to be tangent to this graph. So I found three of them, one, two, and three. And these are my approximate C values that yield the conclusion of my mean value theorem. Okay, moving on to these limit problems. These are just reviewed from what we had last chapter. So this first one, since I'm going out to infinity, I could just take a look at these, and this answer is going to be 5. For the next one, again, I'm going out to infinity, and in this case, the bottom, this coefficient, is much greater than that, so it's increasing at a much greater rate. So the way you can think of it is, you have something over a, something even larger so it's getting to zero. So this is increasing at a much bigger rate right here. So you have one over a really big number, which is going to be essentially zero. Okay, and again, these are just quick shortcut technique ways. Over here, I could take a look at this, and I could take the square root of x squared over x is what I'm looking at. In this case, I've got x, I've got, and I've got to take take a look at these coefficients. This is this is 4x squared, sorry about that. So that'll give me 2x over 2x right here. And this will reduce out to be 1. So again, you're going to take a look at the 4x squared. Don't forget that coefficient. And on the bottom, I've got the 2x. So take the square root of this, you get 2x. Take And to match it up with the bottom, it reduces out, so you end up with 1. So that was a review of last chapter. Okay, so now let's go ahead and go back and do those problems from up above here that we had and um, take a look at this. So for, for part A, I was asked to examine this f of x equaling x cubed times x minus 2. And let me list again what you were to do for this problem. For this problem, you were asked to find the critical points Oops, so let's go ahead and list that as the critical points. So we needed the critical points. Then we needed to find the relative extrema. Then we needed to find any inflection points. Then we needed to find intervals of increasing, decreasing, 
And then we needed to find the intervals of concavity. Uh, I think I could spell that. Concavity. And then we finally needed to find x and y intercepts. Okay, now this isn't the order that we need to do these in, but those are the things that was asked for us in this problem. Okay, so we're going to move this up a little bit more, and we'll come back to that next problem. So, um, let's take a look. This first thing I want to do is, let's go ahead and find, actually we'll make this problem a little bit easier, and I'm going to distribute. So f of x is going to be x to the fourth minus 2x cubed. The reason I did this is so now if I take the derivative such as f prime of x here I get 4x cubed minus 6x squared. It's much easier to work with and then I don't need to do the product rule. So since we have the derivative let's go ahead and set this equal to zero. By setting it equal to zero it gives me my critical points. So I'm going to take out a 2 and an x squared and I'm left with 2x minus 3 equaling zero. So I end up with critical points x equals 0 and 2 thirds. So I did that part. I got the critical points. Okay. Now, how do we know if any of these are going to be relative extrema? Relative minimum, relative maximum? Well, we got to test them. So I like, as we've mentioned before, to do the number line method. So I'm going to put these on a number line. I've got my values here of 0 and I've got my value of 3 over 2. Sorry, this should be 3 over 2. That was my mistake here. This should be 3 over 2. So 3 over 2. Now, taking a look at these, this is my f prime of x. And I'm going to find intervals between 0 and 2 thirds, greater than 2 thirds, and less than 0, and see and plug it in to see what the derivative is. So for example, let's find f prime of negative 1. And here I will get a negative value, so a, neg a negative number. So all these are going to be negatives in here. Let's pick an interval between 0 and 3 halves, or pick a value between 0 and 3 halves. Let's go ahead and pick x equals 1. So f prime of 1 will give me a negative answer as well. So this is going to be negative in here. So this is that first derivative test that we've talked about. And I'm going to do everything based on this first derivative test. If I have to use the second derivative to find the concavity, I will. And in fact, it's asking me to, but I'll take care of that later. So now let's find something greater than 3 halves. Let's say f of 2. So if I f prime of 2. If I plug in f prime of 2, I get a positive number. Now notice, in this, these are slopes, right? The slope changed from a negative to a positive. What does that yield? That yields a minimum right there. So I have, we didn't put that, that was positive. So in this case, I will have a relative minimum at x equals 3 over 2. Again, the critical points determine what numbers I'm going to put on the number line here. In this case, I had 0 and 3 over 2. Um, Again, you set it equal to zero, or you want points where it's undefined. So in this case, we got those two, and I tested them on my first derivative test number line, and I had a relative minimum. Here, there is no change in slope, so I can't conclude anything. But here, I had a negative slope going to a positive slope. This created a minimum at 3 halves. So, so far, I've got the critical points. I've got my relative extrema. Let's see if I can find intervals of increasing and decreasing since I have my first derivative graph. Well, look, from here, from anything negative, let's use the laser, to here, that's negative. It's going to be decreasing. It's also decreasing in this region. And then it's also, now it's increasing three halves and greater. Can I include the zero? No, I can't because at zero, it's neither increasing nor decreasing. So since 0 is neither increasing nor decreasing, I cannot include it. So here is my intervals of in oops, here is my intervals of increasing. So it's increasing, we said from 3 halves to infinity, or you can write it as x greater than 3 halves. It doesn't matter if you write it in this notation with the parentheses and brackets, or if you write it with the inequalities. And it's decreasing when, 
we go from negative infinity to zero, union zero to three halves. Again, if you wrote this in inequality form, you could say when x is less than zero, and then uh, when x is between zero and three halves. So you can write it either way, it doesn't matter. So we've got our intervals of increasing, decreasing. So we did this, and now let's go ahead and take a look at if we have our intervals of concavity, inflection points, and then we still have to find the x and y intercepts. So let's go ahead and move everything up again. So we'll slide all this up. This seems to be sticking here a little bit, so let's move this guy out of the way as well. Okay, so we've got these values. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the second derivative. So we're going to examine the second derivative. So f double prime of x. And what does the second derivative give us? Well, the second derivative will give us concavity. So it'll also help us determine inflection points or possible, infle possible inflection points. And then when we test them, we'll know if they are inflection points for sure. So let's go ahead and take the second derivative. And in this case, we'll get 12x squared minus 12x. Again, I'm taking a look here. And I'm going to set this equal to zero because I want the points where it's zero or undefined because those are possible inflection points. So let's take out a 12 and an x. I'm left with the x minus 1. So I get x equals zero and x equals 1 as my possible inflection points. I don't know if they are until I test them. How do I test them? Again, let's just go ahead and use the number line method because I prefer that and you guys seem to understand it a little bit better when I do that. So let's put these values here, 0, 1. And what I want to do again is test values in these intervals, in here, in here, and in there, and see if they are positive or negative. If it changes, from positive to negative or negative to positive, that means it's changing concavity. When it changes concavity, that means I will have an inflection point. So let's go ahead and try a value here. Let's say f double prime of negative 1. So I put that in my equation and I get positive values. I will get a positive result. Let's go ahead and try f double prime of 1 half, something between 0 and 1. I will get a negative value here. So these are negatives. And then let's try say f double prime of 2. And if I try f double prime of 2, I get positives. So this switches from positive to negative to positive. So what does this tell me? Well, this tells me that it's concave up here and down here and back up there. So that means it's changing concavity. So I do have an inflection point wherever it changes concavity. And in this case, I've got an inflection point at x equals 0 and 1. Now, if you wanted to find the actual values, you can plug the 0 back in to the original equation, and you'll get 0, 0. So we could list it as 0, 0 if I wanted to find the actual point of inflection, and I can list the other one. I plug in 1 into my original equation, and I'll end up with 1 minus 2, which is negative 1. So I could say 1, negative 1. So if I wanted to list the points, if they just wanted the x, x, x value, there you go. If they wanted the actual coordinate, this is how we do it. Be careful on the AP test. Sometimes they'll specify determine at which value it occurs or what is the value. So where it occurs is the x. What is the value of it is going to be our y. Okay, so we've got our points in inflection, and since we have our second derivative, we can determine the concavity. So it's concave up on the interval from, we'll go ahead and say this is going to be from negative infinity to zero. And from 1 to infinity, concave down will be between 0 and 1. And I'm just looking here at my second derivative number line to determine 
this concavity. So we've got our concavity here. So we did our points of inflection, increasing, decreasing, concavity. I just need one more thing. I need to find x and y intercepts. So let's go ahead and slide this up just a little bit. And if I can squeeze this in right here, we will go ahead and do that. So I need to find my x and y intercepts. So for the x-intercept, we're going to set f of x equal to 0. So we will have 0 equaling x to the fourth minus 2x cubed. And in this case, I could take out an x cubed. I'm left with, left with x minus 2. So this happens to yield 0 and 2 for my x-intercepts. Now, for my y-intercepts, I need to find out when x is 0, what the y value will be, and we'll do it Oops, on the side right here. We'll say the y-intercepts is going to be f of 0 in this case, and it will end up being at 0. So my y-intercept is at 0. If you wanted the coordinate, it would be 0, 0 obviously, and my x-intercepts would be at 0, 0, and in this case it would be at 2, 0. So I've got my x-intercepts and my y-intercepts, so we are all done with this problem. Oh, and it asks us, I, I'm not sure if it did, but let's take a look. It asks us to sketch a graph um, actually, it didn't in the original problem. It did not ask to sketch a graph. But if you wanted to sketch a graph, you have all the info that you need. So we'll go ahead and put that in. You know it goes through 0, 0. You know you have a relative minimum. We said it's going to occur at 3 over 2. So at 3 over 2, there's 1, there's 2. At 3 over 2, I have my relative minimum. And I'm just sketching this graph. I know it's concave down in this region, and then it turns to go concave back up. I know that there's an inflection point and then at zero and so this is a quick possible sketch of this graph based on all the information I was given. Okay we've got one final problem to do and it's the same as the other one. This was part B and in this case we had f of x equaling x times x minus 1 squared. Let me remind you again all the things we needed to do. We need to find, and I'll write them here, we needed to find the critical points. We needed to find any relative extrema. We needed to find the inflection points. We needed to find the intervals of increasing or decreasing. We needed to find the intervals of concavity. We needed to find the um, x and y intercepts. And then if we, have, if we can, we can sketch a graph of this. So again, we're doing this all without a calculator. So for this first one, uh, there are multiple ways to do it. If you wanted to do the derivative by taking the product rule, you certainly can. If you want to foil it out and work with it that way, you can do it that way as well. For this problem, I am going to go ahead and I will foil this out. So I'll end up with x times, over here this is going to be x squared minus x minus another x, so minus 2x plus 1. And then I will go ahead and distribute this to get f of x equaling x cubed minus 2x squared plus x. Again, I chose to do it this way because this was not hard foiling out real fast. If this was to the fourth power or fifth power, then you're probably just going to end up just go straight to the product rule, use the product rule, go from there. But since it was squared, it was quicker to do it this way. Let's go ahead this time and find our x and y intercepts first. So for the x intercept, I am going to set this equal to zero. So I want zero equaling, and I'm going to use 
look at this. I'm going to use what it was before I went ahead and foiled it out because it's easier to solve it that way. So here I'll get x equals 0 and x equals 1. So these are my two x-intercepts. So x equals 0 and 1. So again, for the x-intercept, we set y equal to 0. For the y-intercept, we're going to set x equal to 0, because I want to know where the y-intercept is at. So in this case, I'm, I'm looking for f of 0. So again, if I just went ahead and used either one of these, whether I use this one um, here, let's outline it, whether I use this one or the original, it's about the same. So if I'm going to go ahead and use this one, because when I put in 0, that's clear to me that this answer will be 0. So you get y equals 0 at this point. Okay. So y equals 0 is the y-intercept. So let's move on and let's find critical points. So for the critical points, I need to, I need f prime of x equaling 0 or undefined. Okay, so we want, we want to know where it's 0 or undefined. So let's take the derivative of this. So f prime of x. Again, I'm going to look at this form right here because it's easier to work with. That's why I foiled that out. So this is going to be 3x squared minus 4x plus 1. And I want to set this equal to 0. So when I set this equal to 0, I can factor this out, and this ends up factoring to 3x minus 1 times x minus 1, equaling that 0. So I end up with x equaling 1 third, and the other value is 1. And these are my critical points, my critical numbers. So how do I know if any of these are a maximum or minimum? Well, at this point, we have to test them to find out if they are any relative extrema. So my critical points ended up being x equals 1 third and 1. I will put those there. Okay, so let's test them on a number line. Here's my number line. There's f prime of x, my f prime of x number line. I'm going to put my two values there. I have a value at 1 third. And I have a value at 1. So I have an x value at 1 and an x value of 1 third. So let's go ahead and test this region in here. So I could put in 0. That's probably the easiest one. Test this region in there. So put in a half. And then test this region in there. So put in 10, 20. It doesn't matter. So again, I can test f of 0. f prime of 0, sorry. f prime of 1 half, say. And then f prime of 10 just to determine my where my positives and negatives are. If I test 0, if I put in a 0, I'm going to get positive values. Again, I'm putting these, in case you have any questions about that, into the f prime. So when I put in 0, notice I get a 1, so that's a positive value. Okay, if I test this region in here, I get a negative. And if I test this region in here, I get a positive. So look what's happening in these regions. Let's slide this up a little bit. So in these regions, I'm getting a positive slope. Remember, the derivative, the derivative is a slope there. And I get a negative slope. So what does this give me? That gives me a relative maximum. Over here, I've got a negative slope and a po that changes to a positive slope. So what does that yield? It yields a relative minimum. So I have a relative maximum. And we'll write it right here. A relative maximum at x equaling one third and a relative minimum at x equaling one. Again, if you wanted to find the corresponding y values, just plug them back into the original equation. That'll help us later when we're trying to sketch a graph. So I have relative extrema. We have a relative max. We set at x equals one third and a relative minimum at x equals one. All right, so let's find intervals of concavity. So intervals of concavity. Or actually, let's do the increasing, decreasing first. So let's go ahead and do increasing. Intervals of increasing and decreasing. And the reason why I want to do this one first is because I have the first derivative graph. So anywhere where it's positive, such as here, this is an increasing interval. Anywhere where it's negative is a decreasing interval. Again, it's heading downwards, the slopes are down. It's heading upwards, the slopes are up. So the intervals of increasing or decreasing. So let's go ahead and 
write this correctly. So we have increasing from negative infinity to one third. And union, we have from one to infinity. So we will union those two. Those are my intervals of increasing. You can write this in interval notation. You would just write x less than one third, and you would have to also write x greater than one. So you can write it in that notation. For decreasing, um, it's going to happen between one third and one. So if you wanted to write it in interval notation, it's one third and one. If or you can go ahead and write it and just be consistent the way we've been with our open brackets here. So these are our intervals of increasing and decreasing. So we've done that. A um, couple things left. We have to find inflection points, intervals of concavity, and then we can see if we can draw a rough sketch of this. So again, let's move this up. And let's go ahead and find the second derivative because I want to find inflection points. So for inflection points, we need f double prime of x. So in this case, the second derivative is going to yield 6x minus 4. So we will set this equal to 0, and we will get x equals 4 sixths. Let's reduce that down to be 2 thirds as a possible inflection point. How do we know if it is an inflection point? We have to test it. This is just a possible inflection point. And so let's go ahead and test it on our number line. There is 2 thirds. This is f double prime of x. Pick an interval. Pick a number in this interval. Pick a number in this interval. And what ends up happening is when you pick a number here, you will get a negative. When you pick a number here, it will end up being a positive. So we are changing from negative to positive. Since there is a change, this is concave down. This is concave up. Since we have a change in concavity, we will have an inflection point there. So, yes, we do have an inflection point at, and this occurs at x equals 2 thirds. So, we have the intervals of concavity now. And let's go ahead and list these. We already said it's concave down from negative infinity. So this is down from negative infinity to 2 thirds. And then we said it's concave up from 2 thirds to infinity. Again, you can write this as x less than 2 thirds, x greater than 2 thirds. So either way is fine. No both ways, because you will see both ways on the AP test. Now, let's see if we can draw a quick sketch of this. So let's slide this up a little bit. And let's see if I can draw a quick sketch of what's happening here. I know that I have a relative maximum at one third. So at one third right here, it reaches some sort of peak. And you can plug the x value in to get the actual y's, but we're just doing a rough sketch here. I know that it's going to go through the point zero, zero because of the equation that I have. And I know that it's concave down and it goes through this point one zero where it also reaches a minimum. So it peaks there and it's concave down in this region. Okay, and then it changes and it's concave up in that region right there. So from two thirds we said it's concave up and it reaches a minimum right there, a maximum at one third and this is at 1. Let me label that. And so then it continues on in that direction. So that's a quick rough sketch of what we're looking at here. All right. Hope this helped. Uh, we will do another one of these, and I will post it up. So keep looking for it.